America's coastline is the battleground for the nation's most unheralded military branch, the U.S. Coast Guard. The only service that flies into action every day of the year. The only branch with a mission not to take lives, but to save them. In the east, it meanders from the rocky coast of New England to the turquoise waters of the Florida Keys. In the west, it runs from the surfing havens of Southern California to the glacier-walled bays of Alaska. In all, the coastline of the continental United States stretches over 15,000 miles. And as anywhere land meets sea, scenes of men on the open water can, in an instant, transform themselves from the tranquil to the terrifying. With engine out and rigging lost, breakers the size of small mountains slam into this 41-foot yacht. Overhead, a Coast Guard chopper crew arrives on scene, guided by the boat's electronic distress beacon. It is a mission repeated thousands of times every year by the men and women of the nation's smallest, least visible, but most active branch of the armed services. The crew worked frantically to prepare a rescue basket. While below, a survivor clings to wreckage in 20-foot swells. It is a drama that hasn't changed since men first took to sea and in times past, the outcome would almost certainly have been tragic. But for the last 50 years, Coast Guard search and rescue teams have been pulling sailors and seamen out of harm's way. On an average day, 16 people otherwise lost are saved. One life every 90 minutes. This man, making a lone passage from the U.S. mainland across the Caribbean, was miles from the nearest shore when spotted. Just one fortunate individual among nearly 6,000 saved every year. In all, there are over 55 million recreational boaters in the United States. At any given time, another 38,000 merchant seamen work off of American shores piloting the freighters and tankers that are the lifeblood of the nation's industry. All are better off because of Coast Guard aviation. Theirs is the only branch of America's armed services with the stated mission to save life and not take it. Only minutes after arriving on scene, the chopper crew lifts the disoriented and severely hypothermic survivor to safety. One of the Coast Guard's most modern weapons in carrying out this mission is the HH-65 Dauphine medium-range helicopter. This Aerospatiale Dauphine, French for dolphin, is one of the 96 that have been in service since 1982. Prowling the skies from Alaska to Florida, they carry their three-man crews on an endless cycle of SAR or search and rescue missions. Some of the nearly 70,000 carried out in an average year by the U.S. Coast Guard. To be sure, the Coast Guard is dwarfed by the other four services. But in actuality, this Dauphine crew is part of an organization that, standing alone, is the seventh largest naval air force in the world. With a mission range of 150 nautical miles and a top speed of 196 miles per hour, the Dolphin can engage in a 15-minute search and a 15-minute rescue once on site. 
The HH-65's three-man crew is composed of a pilot, co-pilot, and flight mechanic. The flight mechanic doubles as the team's hoist rescue operator. It is his job to maneuver the rescue sling or basket to the survivors below. The helicopter's four 38-foot composite rotors, said to have an infinite fatigue life, are powered by two Lycoming 680 horsepower engines. And the insurance of having two engines is enhanced by the aircraft's OEI, or one engine operative switch, that will transfer the entire fuel flow to the good engine should one of the Lycomings fail at low level. Below, a rescue swimmer awaits evacuation from a Coast Guard 30-foot surf boat. The hoist, mounted on a fairing above the starboard door, is capable of lifting 600 pounds. During a hoisting operation, whether a drill or the real thing, the rescue hoist mechanic is the one actually flying the aircraft. Every movement the pilot makes is choreographed by the mechanic via intercom. And in bad weather, the dolphin can even make a fully automated descent. The aircraft's flight director is coupled to its computer, which takes over the flight controls from the pilot and on its own can bring the helicopter to a 50-foot hover, all hands off. But this drill, like most rescues, is carried out fully hands-on. And to stay sharp, crews spend an inordinate amount of time perfecting this skill. Professional patience seems endemic to the men and women of the service because these crewmen know that the real thing is always just around the corner. At the Coast Guard Air Station in North Bend, Oregon, a dolphin is rolled out for duty. Somewhere in the cold waters off the Pacific coast, this crew has gotten word of a young boy swept out to sea by a riptide. The Coast Guard motto, always ready, and the ceaseless regimen of drills are about to be put to the test. Within minutes, crew and helicopter are on their way. With water temperatures hovering in the 50s, even a strong swimmer won't last long. Time is as much an adversary as the sea itself, and finding a frightened young boy on a vast ocean is a daunting challenge. Once on sight, the burden falls primarily to this man, the rescue swimmer. A relatively new position in the Coast Guard, the rescue swimmer is the crucial human link at the end of the search and rescue chain. The Coast Guard started with rescue swimmers in 1985. They had an accident off the North Carolina coast where a ship went down and 33 people were killed. The Coast Guard arrived on scene but had no way of getting the people out of the water because they were so hypothermic they couldn't get out of the basket themselves. And in these waters off of Oregon, hypothermia is almost always an issue. Every year, hundreds of American children drown. These men are intent that this boy not be one of them. He's been in the water now for nearly half an hour. Looks like he's okay, we're gonna deploy rescue, so we're gonna 
Less than five minutes after takeoff, the boy is gathered up by the rescue swimmer as crewmen above prepare to lift him to safety. Frozen Bering Sea, the fishing vessel Alaskan Monarch, caught in ice pack and battered by heavy swells, is taking on water. Soon, a Coast Guard H-3 Pelican arrives on scene. Meanwhile, the ship, with its engines gone, is slowly being dashed against a reef lying unseen beneath the thick layer of ice. And the ship's crew makes its way to the bow for immediate rescue. This H-3, stationed in Juneau, has traveled nearly 300 miles across the frozen Bering Straits to respond to the emergency. The Pelican operates in one of the most inhospitable environments on Earth, but it's equal to the task. The chopper is one of the oldest but most respected aircraft in the Coast Guard inventory. Of the 40 delivered in 1969, all but four are still in active service. With the last crewman pulled off the bow, captain and mate, who had insisted on trying to save their vessel, are now intent on saving themselves. Their hesitancy costs them dearly. The men will last less than three minutes in the frigid water. Above, the Pelican crew worked desperately to maneuver the aircraft into position. Over one full minute has now passed. The pack ice and rough sea make a rescue swimmer deployment only an option of last resort. The crew lowers a basket in hopes that the men below will have enough energy left to get in on their own. Seconds later, the first man collapses into the rescue basket and is hauled aloft. In just under three minutes, through the calm professionalism of the Pelican crew above, the second man is lifted to safety. Amazingly, the drama ends with the ship itself as the only casualty. Across the continent and an ocean away, Coast Guard pilots are carrying out an entirely different kind of mission over a frozen sea. Every year, a Coast Guard C-130 Hercules flies over this spot in the vast North Atlantic to lay a wreath in commemoration of the 1,500 passengers of the Titanic lost in the waters below. And although the great ship has long since passed into legend, Icebergs like the one that ripped open its hull still drift through the shipping lanes of the Great Circle route where the Titanic met its fate over 80 years ago. We provide the platform for the, uh, the SLAR side-looking airborne radar, uh, which is uh, used to detect the icebergs. Uh, and from that, we can detect the, uh, the limits to the south and to the uh, east, how far to the limit the icebergs extend. From March through September, Coast Guard C-130 aircraft 
flying out of Gander, Newfoundland, patrol a 33,000 square mile area off the Grand Banks. A rugged region of the North Atlantic, it is one of the world's busiest shipping lanes and a natural route for the thousands of icebergs that break off the western coast of Greenland and drift south on the Labrador Current. You can see where the iceberg is, it's a hard target, and that's vapor coming off, vapor trail coming off the iceberg itself because it's so warm, it's like a fog. Traveling as fast as 10 miles a day, it can take some three years to melt. Throughout that time, even smaller bergs the size of a piano can weigh up to 10,000 pounds and shred a ship's hull to pieces. That berg's uh, course 196 at about six knots. Their threat is not taken lightly, and in the 1950s, Coast Guard aircraft even experimented with dropping thermite bomblets on the icebergs, each capable of burning at half the temperature of the surface of the sun. We'll be flying at 150 knots, uh, 500 feet, uh, 450 feet is on the radar. Roger. Now, instead of thermite bombs, the only things dropped over the course of their six to eight hour missions are drift buoys to determine the direction and speed that the currents will carry these mountains of ice. Every year, Coast Guard C-130s track thousands of icebergs, ranging in size from 10,000 pound growlers to multi-billion pound giants the size of aircraft carriers. Roger, you're 30 seconds. Stand by, stand by. Go ahead and drop the buoy when you can. Let me know when it's out. Since the ice patrol's inception, not a single ship has suffered the fate of the Titanic. And it is expected that C-130s will continue to safeguard mariners well into the 21st century. Far to the south, men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard track the flow of a much more vulnerable and precious tide. Every year, it is left to sea and airborne elements of the service to intercept thousands of refugees trying to make it to American shores. Fleeing economic and political persecution at home, People from the nations of the Caribbean Basin and Latin America seeking a better life board anything that will float in hopes of reaching the United States. This ramshackle boat, filled beyond capacity with nearly 500 Haitians, was spotted by Coast Guardsmen alerted to its location by colleagues flying overhead. It is soon clear that the dilapidated vessel won't last long on the open sea. Its human cargo must be taken aboard the cutter before it's too late. But in the melee to board, the boat finally gives way. In spite of heroic effort, this old man is just one of thousands who will never find a new life in America. And although most make it safely aboard the cutter, their future is tenuous at best. 
Some may remain at sea with thousands of others consigned to life aboard U.S. Coast Guard and Navy holding vessels. Others may be sent to refugee camps to live with tens of thousands of their fellow countrymen scattered around the region. Only one thing is fairly certain. Most, if not all, will never set foot on American soil. Much of the burden of refugee search and rescue falls to crews flying the Sikorsky HH-60 Jayhawk. Based on the Army's Black Hawk helicopter, the Jayhawk is an improvement on every chopper in the Coast Guard inventory, including the Dolphin. The Jayhawk can cruise at 135 knots and carry out a six-hour mission over a 300-mile radius. Once on site, the aircraft can remain on station for over 45 minutes and haul up to six people aboard. It is here the Coast Guard Jayhawk crews find their biggest challenge. The waters of the Florida Straits, which run like a river with the Gulf Stream, separate the desperate people of Cuba from Key West, just 90 miles away. By the thousands, they take to homemade rafts that often defy belief in hopes of finding freedom and prosperity to the north. Many are lost in the crossing, and the first American survivors see is often one in Coast Guard orange, wearing fins, mask, and snorkel. These rafters are lucky. It is not uncommon for Coast Guard crews to fly for days and spot only empty rafts drifting below. Mute testimony to the sacrifice of their occupants. Others, undetected by search and rescue teams, are swept past the Florida coast in the swift current, sometimes within sight of the lights of Miami itself, only to be carried far out into the Atlantic, never to be seen again. Here, the training and stamina of the rescue swimmer are called into action again and again. Refugees are often so dehydrated and weak they can't even stand on their own. And over the course of a typical year, nearly 5,000 are plucked from southern waters every month. Trained alongside their Navy and Air Force counterparts, Coast Guard swimmers face challenges unknown to the other services. The biggest difference is the Air Force and the Navy gear their training toward rescuing down military aviators. We go through their schools and are trained the same way, but once we get to a field unit, we need to be trained how to rescue civilians. Downed aviators are people that have been through survival training, been hoisted by helicopters before. When we go out there and rescue mom and pop, they've never been hoisted in a helicopter before. They've never had to eat the rotor wash or work with the rescue devices. During times like the 1980 Marielle boat lift, the number of refugees in need can easily increase tenfold. And in August 1994, Coast Guard personnel set an all-time record, rescuing nearly 3,200 Cuban boat people in a single day. On this mission of mercy, the HH-60 employs state-of-the-art radar, radio, and navigation gear including the Navstar Global Positioning System. With this, the Jayhawk gives new legs to the search and rescue mission, enabling crews to come to the aid of the distressed from greater distances than ever before. After three days adrift, these young Cuban men have found refuge and will soon be staking claim to a piece of the American dream. Changing U.S. policy, however, now dictates that many who follow them will exchange the terror of braving the open sea for the tedium of life in a refugee camp back in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The aircraft that the Jayhawk will eventually replace is the venerable Sikorsky H-3 Pelican. 
an elongated box with a drop ramp in the rear, the Pelican is really just a revamped version of the Air Force's HH-3 Jolly Green Giant, used to rescue downed airmen in Vietnam. But the relationship is nothing new. Some Jolly Greens were flown by Coast Guard pilots throughout the war in Southeast Asia. Many hate to see the Pelican retire. Known for dependability, the Pelican can head out at a distance of over 200 miles and loiter on scene for 18 minutes during rescue operations. Powered by twin GE 1,500 horsepower turboshaft engines, the Pelican is the only Coast Guard chopper existing or planned that can land in water. For the rescue swimmer, that means that survivors can be brought aboard more quickly and more safely than in any hover and hoist maneuver. And in the shark-infested waters south of Florida, speed and safety are always an issue. A swim like this is a daily chore for most rescue swimmers. But for the men in the raft, it is anything but routine. Many rafters are ragged in torn shoes and pants. Most have swollen feet or blistered hands from rowing. Some talk of drinking their own urine. They carry water-soaked bundles, photographs of girlfriends, wives, and mothers. Too often they have bloodshot eyes with that faraway glaze of people lost at sea. These men are fortunate to have made it this far. Fair weather turns foul here very quickly. 40 mile an hour gusts and short, steep waves reaching eight feet are common. Waves that would easily swallow up inner tube rafts like theirs. It has already been a busy day for this Pelican crew. This is the second group of refugees brought aboard in the past hour. With his waterproof walkie-talkie, the swimmer appraises the pilot of the situation. With one man severely dehydrated, unconscious, and near death, the crew opt to use the basket to get him aboard. Again, the choreography between machine and crew works flawlessly. This man eventually survives. What isn't known are just how many don't make it. In Cuba, there is often talk of bodies washing ashore. But the government there is less than forthcoming with any statistics. And although estimates vary widely, it is commonly accepted that among Cuban boat people alone, the number of men, women, and children who set out from shore every year, never to be seen again, may run into the thousands. On any given day, Coast Guard forces seize over 80,000 pounds of marijuana, as well as great quantities of cocaine being smuggled in across our southern border. But in reality, victories like this are all too rare. Officials estimate that despite intensive effort, 18 million pounds of marijuana 300,000 pounds of cocaine and 13,000 pounds of heroin enter the U.S. every six months. 
and many say that these estimates themselves are low. The counter-drug effort faces problems from within as well. Agencies sharing the burden of the battle range from the CIA, DEA, and FBI to the Customs Service and the Coast Guard each with their own set of priorities, each with their own individual agenda. And rivalry between U.S. government bureaucracies can be as much of a hindrance to effectively fighting the smugglers as the smugglers themselves. Here, members of Caribbean regional security forces, endowed by their governments with law enforcement powers, pose in front of an HH-3 Pelican during a surge against smugglers known as Operation Nutmeg. The flexibility of Coast Guard helicopter-borne forces such as this have given law enforcement people a flexible tool in fighting the war on drugs. This illegal trade is carried out by well-financed, heavily armed, and highly sophisticated organizations. Routinely, drug smugglers ditch or abandon planes once they've served their purpose. And when one load represents more money than a fleet of aircraft, it is a loss easily absorbed by wealthy drug lords. This is the HU-25 Falcon. In its drug interceptor version, it is also known as the Night Stalker. The HU-25 Falcon has provided Coast Guard aviators with a state-of-the-art tracking and surveillance platform capable of thwarting even the most sophisticated drug smuggler. The Falcon represents the newest plane in the Coast Guard air wing, and the 41 purchased at a cost of $5 million each represent the most expensive procurement program ever undertaken by the service. Developed by the Falcon Jet Corporation, a French aviation firm, the Falcon has been well worth the cost. Able to reach speeds of 0.85 Mach, it is by far the fastest plane that the Coast Guard takes to flight. The aircraft's twin turbofan jet engines are not only fuel efficient and easily serviced, but offer great loiter capability at lower speeds and altitudes, an attribute incredibly important to both SAR and drug interdiction missions. The Night Stalker poses a serious challenge to any drug smuggler trying to make it to American shores undetected. Inside the nose is an APG-66 radar, identical to that employed on the F-16 fighter. With its FLIR, forward-looking infrared receiver, the Night Stalker boasts night vision capabilities. These combined mean that Falcons flying missions up to four hours long can pick up smugglers from 150 miles away and track them until Coast Guard or DEA helicopters pick them up. In 1982, the Coast Guard confiscated just nine pounds of cocaine. By 1992, that figure had skyrocketed to 300,000 pounds. The increase reflects not simply the effectiveness of modern interdiction weapons like the Falcon, but also an American public's demand for illegal drugs that has grown at an astronomical rate over the past decade. In fighting the drug war, the Falcon often operates from forward bases on smaller islands. Here, shorter landing strips often necessitate shoot deployments. It is all just part of an aggressive strategy to take the drug war as close to the enemy's doorstep as possible. But this enemy has vast resources, one able to match nearly every move made against it with sophisticated countermeasures. Countermeasures that can often take the drug war as close to the realms of Tom Clancy and Ian Fleming as the real world ever gets. Once the sun sets, Caribbean waters become the scene of a high-tech hide-and-seek played out every night of the year. One of the Coast Guard's newest denizens of the night is the secretive Schweitzer RG 8A powered glider, a low-tech stealth weapon with an acoustic detector. The aircraft can glide in and pinpoint smugglers without revealing its own presence in the skies above. Overhead, it 
In addition to monitoring aircraft, Falcons spend much time tracking high-speed motorboats slipping in and out of the thousands of inlets dotting American shores. Here, a Falcon crew uses their FLIR to track a high-speed drug boat having already brought a DEA Blackhawk onto the scene. But boats like this one aren't the only tools at the smuggler's disposal. Recently, they have taken to stealth boats that ride so low in the water that they are nearly submerged. The fiberglass and wood boats have no sharp edges to be detected by radar and are painted blue to make them hard to spot from the air. It's just another escalation in the quiet high-tech war in which the Falcon is an integral player. The Falcon is responsive to a 3,000 mile long radar fence that stretches across America's southern coast and border. Uh, we'll be in a high orbit. Uh and pick them up on the radar or visually or from vectors from one of our uh, E2s or AWACs uh, that we are usually working with out of DOD. Pick them up, we uh, drop down to about uh, 2,000 feet. Here again, inter-service rivalries can hamper the mission. Falcons respond to a warning network of Hawkeyes and aerostat balloons that west of Houston, Texas are controlled by the U.S. Customs Service and from Houston eastward by the U.S. Coast Guard. Suspect planes often fall into an easily recognized profile. Fake tail numbers, flying very low on the deck, and deviating from false flight plans, or no flight plan at all, are strong indicators that the target is a legitimate one. Okay, you can keep on the clear as long as you can, okay? I'm gonna come up back around. With the smaller plane lost in low-lying clouds and evening setting in, the crew quickly switches to their FLIR infrared tracking system. Aircraft like this one will be tracked in a covert position until helicopters can be brought okay, on scene. Right. Okay, that's fine. On short final. Looks like he's landing to the northwest. Crossing over the threshold now, landing to the northwest. 7 0, you copy? Okay, we got him. Okay, he's like slowing he's up. Way, and he's uh, slowing up. He's committed. And he stopped on the runway. It looks like he just kicked the package out. He kicked his package out and he's uh, taxiing to the end of the runway. Fleur technician and Falcon pilot maintain a constant dialogue with the Black Hawk pilot hovering somewhere below. He's at the uh, northwest end of the runway. He stopped. And stopped. He's turning around. And turning. He's 90 degrees. He's pointed down the runway. Many drug pilots don't ever touch down, opting instead to drop ice coolers packed with cocaine into the sea, there to be collected by waiting speedboats. The airplane has still stopped. He's moving. He's rolling toward you. In the dark of night, this drug pilot still has no idea that he has company in the skies above. He has. He's rolling toward you. I don't see him. He's on the runway. He's taking off. Where's the runway from us? Going straight.
got me with your wing. Zero one. You see him right in front of you? He's right below you, right below you. Alright, sir. You just passed over him. Take a right. He doesn't have the speed to take off. He doesn't have the speed to take off. Taking off. He's not in the air. He's. Uh, you see him right below you. He's uh, at the end of the runway. He's turning around again. He's turning around. I think. Cut him off to the right, Dave. Cut him off to the. He's right below you. Set down. Let's get right out of him right now. Right there. Right there. Okay. Turn left. Turn left. Get him. History. He's getting out of the aircraft. He's getting out. Everybody out. Out, 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 out. He's running to the left. He's running to the left. But with the Falcon still overhead, escape on foot is nearly impossible. There they are, right there on the clear. I see him. You see him cleared up. Okay, when you get that wing hard, I'm going to lose him. I look like I turned to the left. Not too hard. This is good right here. We just keep this in. I still got him. Yeah, it looks like they're trying to hide now. Better hide. Can you get marked that position anyway? Yeah, it's 25, 22 north. I uh, just lost it. Near, I think. Okay, got him. They're right along the shoreline. There you are. Okay, they're hiding in the grass right there. They're just in front of that one guy right there. there. The guy's getting ready to walk right on him, right in the grass, right in front of him. Okay, he's right in front of him. He's right in front of the yeah, He's getting ready to get up on the guy right there. Oh. He's got him. Yeah, he's got him. He's got him both. All right. As the DEA Blackhawk stands vigil overhead, ground units take the drug pilots into custody. This night marks a victory for the interdiction effort and for Coast Guard aviation. But victories like this are the exception to the rule because for every smuggler caught, hundreds more slip in undetected. And as Coast Guard aviation loses funding to other priorities in the war on drugs, priorities like education and rehabilitation, Drug lords are sure to find new holes in America's electronic fence to the south. A fence that will need to be steadily manned and constantly mended well into the foreseeable future.